Our preacher tonight is a fourth generation preacher. The chapel on the campus of Dillard University is named after his great grandfather. He comes from that line of preachers. Our preacher went to Duke University and Boston College and he is preaching his ministry is nothing short of meteoric. He is the eighth pastor of the over 200 year old Alfred Street Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. And I was invited to preach there. He invited me to come for their men's day celebration. And I preached Saturday night, three times Sunday morning, and I slept until September, and that was in May that he invited me there to preach. The ministry of Alfred Street is felt not only in the Washington, D.C. area, but there are some persons here tonight from Jackson State University, the Houston area chapter, alumni chapter of Jackson State University. Wherever you are, would you stand? I want to acknowledge your presence and thank you for being here tonight. The Alfred Street, the social justice ministry of Alfred Street, the president is here with uh, members of Jackson State University alumni, Houston area chapter alumni. And I suspect that they are here because Alfred Street just gave them $1 million. Uh, that's a pretty good reason to come to church. Uh, that's the impact of his ministry over at Alfred Street Church. He's been to our campus before, and he is one of my favorite preachers to hear preach. Uh, after the singing of Father, I stretch my hands to thee, no other help I know, will be our preacher for this night, Dr. Howard John Wesley of the Alfred Street Church. Hear ye him. Let's all stand. like you mean it.
was the hymnist who said, Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Brothers and sisters, grace and peace be unto you. From God our Father, and Jesus Christ, who always and alone is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning, and our returning Redeemer. This is another day that the Lord has made. And by the mercies of God, we've made it to the end of another day. When you live long enough, you know that if you see the morning and the evening of any day, it's not because you were so good or so wise, because you followed the right directions on the highway to avoid the accident, but you've come to the end of a day because grace was sufficient. How grateful I am to God for the privilege, and I mean that honestly, to stand in this place where every Sunday I watch online to hear a word from the Lord. Every, every preacher needs a preacher. And you all are blessed to have one of the best in the kingdom of Christ to proclaim the true and the living word. If you love Pastor Terry Anderson and you know God has used him to be a blessing to your life, would you just help me honor Pastor tonight as we thank God for how God speaks to us through our pastor. Pastor, I want to thank you publicly, not simply for the invitation to stand, but he doesn't know it, but he plays a very unique role in my life. My oldest son, who bears my name, has now begun driving, and I went to purchase him a car about a year ago. One of the things that was most important to me in selecting a car was to make certain it had the right safety mechanisms. I want to make certain that at his 18-year-old self, if he finds himself wandering, that there's something that helps save his life. You need to make certain it had airbags. You need to make certain that it wouldn't start if the seatbelt wasn't clicked. Had to be certain that it could shut off the text messaging while he was in the car. <laughs> the car I got him has a safety mechanism that is new. Maybe your car has it. That there's a little light in the side view mirror. It's meant to let you know when there's a vehicle in your blind spot. Because sometimes you don't know what you can't see. So you need something to help you see that there's something you can't see. If he ignores the light to let him know there's something in his blind spot, when he starts to veer out of his lane, the car begins to beep and let him know you are straying out of your lane and there's danger next to you. And if by chance he ignores the light and ignores the beeping, the steering wheel will jerk him back in and let him know you don't want to go over there. There's danger over there. Let me tell you why I love Pastor Anderson. I watch him every Sunday because I know every now and then I need someone to help me see what I don't see. And if by chance I'm straying out of God's will and God's way, I need a little voice in my ear to let me know you don't want to go over there. And then by chance, if I happen to my sinful ways, just leak over a little bit. He's got a word that will just yank you back. It may not always feel good. It may not always make you shout. The world may not always receive it. But thanks be to God for a voice that lets us know when there's danger. A voice that says don't stray. And a voice that says get back in the center of the word of God. He's my safety mechanism. And pastor, I thank you. In a world, in a realm where the word is so often compromised, that there's one who is faithful and true. He's right here at Lily Grove. I wish I brought my phone. I want to take a picture. My mama is not going to believe I made it. <laughs> to look, somebody take a picture and send it to me so my mama will know I was actually where I said I was here at Lily Grove. It's a humbling honor when I saw those who God has called to preach in this season of revival 
the Reverend Ralph Douglas West, the Reverend Dr. Frank Ray, who is a walking Bible, to know that Tellus Chapman is coming after me. I don't know who got sick, but I'm glad I was the backup. And I mean, we're going to pray for, for his COVID, whoever he is, and how grateful I am that the Lord has called me here. Lord, I thank you for the power of your word. And you stepped into nothingness, and whatever you said be had to become. We thank you for our written word, the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. I thank you for your incarnate word in Jesus Christ who came to live out the truth of your word, that as we mimic and model our lives after Jesus, we might be aligned with your will and your word. Lord, I pray now for the Holy Spirit power to preach your word. You and I both know I'm not worthy. Pray that you would speak to those who come not only to hear your word, but to do, do it also, that together we might experience the fruit of your word. In the name of Jesus, our Christ, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Before I read my text, I want to let you know that by the grace of God this past April, I was able to celebrate my 50th birthday. And on behalf of those of us who've got 50 in the rearview mirror, and those who don't think you'll ever make it and it's on the way, allow me to testify, life changes at 50. At, at 50, I wake up some mornings and things hurt for no good reason. At 50, my left knee will tell you when it's gonna rain. I wish I had some grown folk here at 50, stuff that used to live upstairs has moved downstairs and refuses to go back where it belongs. At 50, when I go to the gym, I've got to stretch before I work out. If I can be honest, sometimes the stretch is the workout. <laughs> At 50, there's certain things I know I'm not supposed to eat anymore. And my body will tell me immediately when I've eaten something I should not have. At 50, I realize that I potentially have more years behind me than ahead of me. And so I've made the decision that I'm going to live my best life every day. At 50, I really came to the point where I don't care if you like me or not. If you don't like me, that's your problem. At 50, I decided that I'm just not going to bite my tongue anymore. Whatever I got to say, is going to be said. At 50, I decided I'm not going to let your suntan cousins in Virginia put me in an early grave. At 50, I made a decision that I'm going to live my best life now. And I'm guided by the words of the mystic theologian Howard Thurman, who said that good life really boils down to two questions. Where am I going and who's going with me? That at the end of the day, God has a way of directing us and grooming us and guiding us through the relationships of the people who are in our lives. If you really want to know what someone's about, don't ask them who they are. Look at who they're running with. That God uses people to groom us. A good friend of mine once said that when God wants to bless us, God doesn't send things, God sends people. People may have some things, but God has a way of growing us in right relationship. 
Friends, nobody models the power of productive partnership more than Jesus our Christ. Jesus in his life shares and shows us the power of productive relationship and the danger of dysfunctional ones. Especially in his choosing of these 12 men who would follow him and help him in his assignment on earth to build the kingdom of God and proclaim the good news of Jesus on the other side of his death. The calling of these 12 in relationship with Jesus is found in all three synoptic gospels, Luke 6 and in Mark 3. But tonight, for a very special reason, I want you to hear the calling of these 12 as recorded by the gospel writer of Matthew. As you're turning to the gospel of Matthew chapter 9, I would that you keep your Bibles open. I know that this is a Bible-believing, preaching congregation. And I don't have many cliches. All I got is Bible. I'm going to try to teach Bible and get out of Dr. Chapman's way. Matthew chapter 9, I want to begin reading in verse number 35 and read into chapter 10. Matthew chapter 9, I'm reading out of the New International Version, but I know your Bible reads somewhat the same. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, <laughs> but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits, to heal every disease and sickness. And these are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who some of y'all call Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Reverend Washington, I lift up Matthew's recording of the calling of the Twelve because Matthew puts together two words that deeply disturb me. Unlike John or Mark or Luke, Matthew pulls together two words that ought to really disturb our discipleship. Two words that ought to trouble us in our walk with the Lord. Two words that ought to upset you when you really think about the implication of what it means in your life. Two words that I want to use for the title of this little sermon here. Those two words come to us in verse number four, where Matthew puts these two words together. And Judas. and Judas. Write that on the side of your Bible, and Judas. Simon Sinek in his best-selling work on leadership suggests that every good leader begins with asking the question, why? If you want to understand the how, you need to understand the why. 
you want to know what we're doing, you should first understand why we're doing it. That seems like a good place to start with this journey of discipleship when Jesus chooses these 12 to ask the question, why does Jesus choose 12 disciples? Why Peter and them? Why Matthew? Why Thaddeus? Why does Jesus choose 12 disciples? Well, I know, I know you are good Bible readers and you've been under good Bible preaching. And you were probably the valedictorian of your third grade Sunday school class. So you know that there is some theological significance in the number 12. Somebody's going to tell me he chose 12 to mirror the 12 tribes of Israel, those sons of Jacob who are named. That, that 12 is, is a number that is replete in the Bible, that we read about the 12 tribes and the 144,000 elders and, and all of those numbers of 12. And so you're going to tell me that Jesus chose 12 because of the theological significance of the number 12. That's the deep answer. But you missed the simple answer. Can I show with you why Jesus chose 12 disciples? In order to understand why Jesus chose 12 in chapter 10, you got to remember what's happening in chapter 9. In chapter 9, the Bible says that Jesus is traveling through all of Judea. He's teaching in the synagogues. He's preaching the kingdom of God. And he's healing every sickness and disease. Don't miss this, it's so simple, you may miss the shout. He's traveling, he's teaching, he's preaching, and he's healing. One more time for the sanctified slow. He's traveling, he's teaching, he's preaching, and he's healing. And in the midst of travel, in the midst of teaching, in the midst of preaching, in the midst of healing, he comes to the undeniable conclusion that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. You want to know why Jesus chose 12 disciples? It really ain't that deep. He needed some help. He recognized that the harvest is plentiful, but I ain't got enough help to do all that God has assigned me to do. And Jesus understands that the assignment of God is greater than my individual ability to handle. That I need some help. Now, if you ain't found an amen, I need to remind you who's talking here. Uh, that, that, that quote, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few, that's in red. Which means that's Jesus talking. This ain't Moses, this, this ain't Elijah, this, this ain't Isaiah, this, this ain't Ezekiel, this ain't Josh, this is Jesus talking. Jesus says, I need some help. You remember Jesus, don't you? One that came up out the Jordan River and God showed up and looked down at him and said, now that's my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You remember that same Jesus then went out into the wilderness and stood toe to toe with Satan in three rounds and gave Satan a TKO in the third round. You remember this Jesus? This the one that walked, y'all remember that walking on water thing? You remember that turning water into wine thing? You remember that getting up in the nap in the middle of a storm and the wind and the wave had to obey whatever he told him to do? You remember this Jesus? This Jesus is so big and so bad that a sister only had to touch the bottom of his robe and she was healed of all her disease. This Jesus says, I need some help. Because the full assignment of God on your life is always greater than your individual ability. If you can do it all by yourself, 
It ain't all God called you to do. If you don't need nobody, this ain't what God called you to do. If you don't need someone to partner with you, you ain't trying to do enough. If you get it done with all your own resources, your vision ain't big enough. If God called you to it, it requires some help. Let me give you a side order of scripture. Uh, you can't get out of Genesis 2 without realizing you need some help. Wish I had a Bible. You go back to Genesis 1, God steps out into creation, and everything God creates, God says, that's good. Can I tell you what that word good means? It's this Hebrew word tov, and it literally means self-sustaining. It doesn't just mean it looks good. It means it can keep on going without God's assistance. So God says, let there be land and let there be sea. And when God sees that the land ain't trying to be the sea and the sea ain't trying to be the land and the land can be the land by itself and the sea can be the sea by itself, God says, now that's good. God then says, let, let the land bring forth vegetation. And when he sees that, that in the springtime, the seed will fall and in the fall, the harvest will come, God says, now that's good. God, God said, now sun, you sit over there, and moon, you stay over there. And when the moon stayed where it was supposed to stay, and the sun stayed where it was supposed to stay, God said, now that's God said, let the fish produce more fish. Let the dog produce more dog. Let the cat get more cat. And when the fish made fish, and the dog made dog, and the cat made cat, God said, Everything is good till we get to chapter two. In chapter two, God takes Adam who he's made and gives him an assignment. Adam, you ain't here just to look cute and pretty. I got work for you to do. Take care of my garden. Name my animals. Tend to my creation. And when God sees Adam trying to do it by himself, God looks at him and says, now wait a minute. That ain't, you can't do that by yourself. So Adam, go lay down and take a nap. And watch what I'm going to do. And when you wake up, you're going to find that I created a helpmate because you can't do it by yourself. I don't know who I came to preach to, sisters. Uh, Eve was not created just to stand underneath Adam. Eve was created to stand next to Adam, to help Adam do what God had assigned him to do. Because you can't do it by yourself. And brother, every time you see her, God is reminding you, <laughs> you can't do it by yourself. Now might I suggest to you that if the word of God to Adam is you can't do it by yourself, and the revelation of Jesus is that I need some help. Might I suggest to you with your Lily Grove sanctified self that you need some help. No matter how big you are, no matter how much money you make, no matter how much scripture you've memorized, everybody needs somebody sometime. Let me tell you why it gets quiet here, because we have been raised in the delusion of me, myself, and I. Somebody hoodwinked you with Rene Descartes' philosophy 
cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. As if your world don't revolve around nothing other than you. You's a big bad mamma jamma. You, you don't need nobody. You can handle it all by yourself. You can you get without anybody's help. You can get it all done. I came by to tell you, everybody needs somebody sometime. Uh-huh. Batman needed Robin. Long Ranger needed Tonto. Yogi needed Boo Boo. Lucy needed Desi. Beyonce need them up with them other girls. Everybody needs somebody sometime. Okay, I see that I, someone over there, you, you don't believe me? I'm gonna show it to you in scriptures right here. Look at how Matthew names the disciples. I wanna make certain you catch this, that, that Matthew does not just give us a list of names. No, no, Pastor Anderson, there's one repeated word in verses two through four that is so obvious we ignore it. It's the word and. Let me make sure you catch the listing. It ain't Peter, Andrew, James. No, it's Peter and Andrew. It's James and John. It's Philip and Bartholomew. It's Thaddeus and Matthew, uh-huh, it, 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 it's, it's Simon and Judas Iscariot that no matter what disciple is named, every disciple has an and. Because you can't be a disciple and grow in God and fulfill the assignment of God on your life if you ain't got no and. And I came all the way from Alexandria, Virginia to ask you a question. Who's your aunt? Who is your aunt? Can I teach Bible? If you understand why Jesus chose them, because even Jesus needed some and, you can better understand who they are. When one looks at the life of Jesus, God, I feel the Bible here, there are different terms used to designate the different relationships Jesus was in. Everybody ain't in the same category. In Scripture, there are at least six categories of relationship that Jesus had. We teach Bible. On the one hand, there's a group called the crowd. Your King James calls them the multitude. Jesus had a crowd. Pastor Aaron said the crowd was not committed to Jesus. They were fascinated by him. The crowd got caught up in the frenzy. The crowd saw miracle and wanted miracle. The crowd showed up as long as there was bread and fish being handed out. The crowd was fickle. That they could holler Hosanna on Sunday. But by Friday, the same crowd could holler crucify. There's the crowd. Then there's another group that follows him called the disciples. Now you need to know the disciples are not a term exclusive to the 12 that are chosen. Disciple was a term used for those who followed Jesus and learned from Jesus and sat at the feet of Jesus and there are more disciples than the 12. Teach the Bible, Pastor. So the Bible says that, that Mary is a disciple. When Jesus is there in her house, she's sitting at his feet. And that is the posture of a disciple learning from their master. Mary is a disciple. Martha is a disciple. Lazarus is a disciple, but he ain't in the 12. Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee, is a disciple. Because when Jesus is crucified, the Bible says Nicodemus, the disciple, came to ask for the body of Jesus. 
We've got the crowd. We've got the disciples. Then we've got the chosen 12. Those names listed right there in Matthew 10 and in Luke 9, 6 and in Mark 3. These 12 names that are chosen. We've got the crowd. We've got the disciples. We've got the 12. Then we've got another group called the apostles. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Look, 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 look. And I know you. You're saying to me, Pastor, the 12 and the apostles are the same. No, they're not. Technically, the apostles were those who received the anointing power of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to go out and teach and proclaim Jesus Christ after they left the upper room. And when you get to the day of Pentecost, the 12 have now become the 11 because Judas ain't with them and they've got to replace him with a brother named Matthias. The apostles are the 11 plus Matthias. The 12 are the 11 plus Judas. Well, we've got the crowd. We've got the disciples. We've got the 12. We've got the apostles. And then we've got the inner circle. And the inner circle were three of them. Oh, I wish I had a Bible reader. Peter, James, and John. And the Bible says whenever Jesus was getting serious about something, he left the 12 and grabbed the three. When he goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration to reveal his glory and Moses and Elijah show up, he didn't take everybody. He took Peter, James, and John. Uh, when, when they're done in the upper room and he's on his way to Calvary but has to make a prayer pit stop at Gethsemane, he does not take all of them. He takes Peter, James, and John. Boy, I feel Bible. There, there's the crowd, the disciples, the twelve, the apostles, the inner circle, and then there was the beloved disciple. And that was only one, John. You remember John? Going back to Calvary's cross while Jesus is hanging there dying, he looks out and finds out only one of the 12 has showed up. It's John, the beloved disciple. And Jesus looks at his mama, Mary, and looks at his beloved disciple and says, hey, I got an idea. Mary, take care of John. John, take care of Mary because y'all need to love each other. John is the only disciple to die a natural death. John makes it to the island of Patmos. He writes the book of Revelation. The beloved disciple, there's only one. Here it is. Recap before your final exam. The crowd. The disciples. The twelve. The apostles. The inner circle. And the beloved. Now here's where it gets real. You ready? Everyone who was in the crowd did not make the cut to be a disciple. And everyone who was a disciple did not land in the 12. And everyone in the 12 did not become an apostle. And all the apostles didn't make it to the inner circle. And all the inner circle was not the beloved disciple. As a matter of fact, when you look at the life of Jesus, the closer he got to Calvary, the smaller the crowd became, and he wound up with only one. I don't know who needs to hear this, but the closer you get to what God has called you to be and created you to do and purposed in your life, the smaller... Here you are upset that she ain't with you and he left you and they broke up with you and she walked away. God said that ain't nothing but confirmation that you're getting closer. Uh, Pastor Anderson, 
There is a generation that needs to hear what I'm about to say. Crowds don't confirm purpose. <sighs> Having a crowd does not mean it's in God's will. Being popular does not mean it's anointed. Just because they got a blue check mark on Instagram doesn't mean God likes it. And there's a whole generation of young people, including young sisters, who are chasing unmerited celebrity. We got folk who are famous on social media and ain't got no talent. There's a generation of young sisters that are building large followers, posting posting pictures of themselves and thinking the more followers you have, the more that confirms what God created you to do. If you don't get anything else from this little Bible study, get this, you don't need everybody. You just need somebody. Go and say that again, Pastor. You don't need a thousand followers. You don't like to, you don't need to be retweeted. You don't have to have everybody like the picture. All you need is one good somebody whom God has assigned to your life to, in order to move to the purpose that God has ordained for you. You don't need a crowd because crowds don't confirm purpose. Some folk are not ordained to walk with you. Don't say that again. Some folk ain't called by God to stand by your side. Can I tell you what I love about Jesus? Here it is, we'll make sure you get this, because remember, everybody who is in the crowd don't become a disciple. Everyone who's a disciple does not become the 12. Everyone who's in the 12 ain't an apostle. All the apostles ain't the inner three. All the inner three ain't the beloved disciple. And here's what I love about Jesus. He never tried to force someone to be in a role or relationship that they were not ordained to be in in his life. Lazarus is a disciple, but he doesn't choose him to be part of the 12. Matthew is in the 12, but he's not named in the inner circle. Peter's in the inner circle, but Jesus doesn't try to make him the beloved disciple because Jesus accepts that everybody in your life has a boundary of where the Lord has said they can and cannot go. Somebody that you're upset on a Monday night because you're trying to put people in categories they don't belong. Can I teach Bible at Lily Grove? Well, I wish I had a hoop. I ain't got one. All I got is Bible. Everyone's not going to catch this, so I'm going to have to repeat it. I want you to notice the difference between verse 1 and verse 2 of chapter 10. Watch what happens. In verse 1, the Bible says Jesus called his disciples together. And in verse number 2, Matthew says, here are the names of the apostles. Okay, you missed it. You missed it. Uh, one more time. In verse 1, Jesus says, bring me the disciples. In verse 2, Matthew says, here are the apostles. Okay, you missed it. You missed it. I'm going to try one more time. Uh, Jesus says, bring me the disciples. Matthew says, here are all the apostles. And then Matthew names them. And here's the problem. He puts Judas on a list of apostles when Judas never became a true apostle. 
Matthew puts Judas on the list of apostles, but Judas never became an apostle. Matthew, you put Judas on a list with an expectation of something he would become only to realize Judas can never be what you wanted him to be. I don't know who I came to preach to in Houston, Texas, but God told me to tell you, stop trying to make Judas an apostle. Stop trying to make them something they are not ordained and can never become. I don't care how much you pray over them. Care how much anointing oil you carry in your purse. I don't care how much of a Daniel fast you go on. At the end of the day, some folk are who they are. And God said, stop upsetting your life trying to expect them to be what I have shown you they can never be. You, you know what hurts us most in life? Not the lies Judas tells us, but the lies we tell ourselves. You're telling yourself she ain't who you know she is. You're lying to yourself, expecting him to be what God has showed you he can never be. You ain't getting nobody to be mad at but yourself. You put them on the list. Can I preach the Bible? Somebody say Judas is who he is. Let me prove it to you in Bible. Because any time you see the name of Judas, it's never Judas with a period, it's Judas with a comma. Every time you see Judas' name, it ain't just Judas. It's Judas, comma, the one who betrayed him. Every time Bible raises Judas, it attaches his betrayal to his name because that's who he is. And you trying to erase the comma. He is who he is. Judas, the betrayer. Y'all, that's, that's what really disturbs me about those two words, and Judas. And Judas. And betrayal and lied on, and abused, and manipulated, and stabbed in the back, and mistreated, and Judas. Those two words bother me because it reveals to us that Judas is Inevitable. It's gonna, get, it's gonna get real quiet. It's about to get real. You can't escape Judas. Can I teach Bible? Uh, in Bible, anywhere you see all the disciples listed, all 12 of them named, you're going to find there are always two commonalities in the listing of their names. Two commonalities, no matter who you read it from. If you read it in Luke, if you read it in Acts, if you read it in Mark, if you read it in Matthew, there are always two commonalities on the list. You ready? Here they are. Number one, the list always starts with Peter. And always ends with Judas. You can't make a list of disciples and keep Judas off it. Y'all, wouldn't it be better if we could just edit Judas off the list? Wouldn't it be better if you could get disciples together and Judas 
not be in the room? I came by to tell you that any list of disciples, no matter whose name is on the front, it's always going to end with Ann Judas. <laughs> I'm not, not, not be invited back. Um, um, every church has a Judas. Every ministry has a Judas. Every committee has a Judas. Every deacon board has a Judas. Every alto section has a Judas. You can't get saints together and not expect that somewhere, somehow, Judas is in the room. Don't look down your pew. That ain't Christian. Keep your eyes on me. Don't look at nobody. But somewhere in the sanctuary of Lily Grove, there is Um, you know who Judas is? Judas joined but never committed. Judas wanted membership on his resume but never had discipleship in his heart. Judas gave in the offering so he could raise his hand on the vote, but never worship God in the sanctuary. Judas, J Judas wanted the microphone, but never wanted a broom. Judas wanted to be seen, Judas never wants to serve. Judas wants to be called on, but Judas never wants to support. Judas wants his name to be on the list, but Judas never had it in his heart. And it is inevitable that wherever you go, you will encounter. I need somebody to say, I know a Judas. I know a Judas. Now, 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 I got to teach Bible and I'm almost out of here. If Judas is a betrayer and he never becomes an apostle, why does Matthew put him on the list? Come here, come here, come here. Remember, Matthew writes at least 50 years after the death of Jesus. He knows good and daggone well Judas ain't make it. But he puts him on the list. Hear me, y'all. Here's what we wrestle with. Why is Judas on a list of apostles when he ain't never become an apostle? I believe that Matthew's trying to teach us something. Don't allow the betrayal of Judas to cause you to doubt the apostolic authenticity of the other 11. Don't let what Judas did make you think Peter ain't no good. Don't let your encounter with Judas say everybody's like Judas. Don't let you encountering a Judas make you think that the other 11 ain't no good. And there's a generation out there right now who has encountered a Judas and have now doubted the collective community and the authenticity of the rest of us. They say things like this. All of them hypocrites. Ain't none of them no good. You know somebody right now who won't go to church because they met Judas. You know somebody right now won't give in the offering plate because they saw that fool up in New York talking about he got robbed in his church while he got 25 members and wearing Christian Dior and Christian LeBowden shoes talking about I got robbed and there's a generation out there that said everybody is a Judas. 
I came all the way to Lily Grove to tell you this. Don't run from the other 11 simply because you met Judas. Don't let Judas run you out of Lily Grove. Don't, don't leave Lily Grove because you met Judas and run over to Wheeler because I got bad news for you. The same Judas who sits and sings in Lily Grove is right down the road at Wheeler Avenue because you can't escape Judas. Um, I'm going to fire my exit. Somebody, you need to know, at some moment on your resume, these two words are going to show up. And Judas. Judas is inevitable. You can't get disciples together without Judas. Can I push it and then I'm going to get out of here? Um, Judas is inevitable, but there's something else that scares me. Can I teach Bible? One of the reasons we love the Gospels is because they all tell the same story, but from a different angle and perspective. And the immature saint tries to argue and debate which one is right, as opposed to holding them all in tension, realizing that together they paint a complete picture. When Luke tells the story of the calling of the 12, he puts a critical detail in the story that Matthew left out. Can I tell you what that is? Luke says this, that before Jesus chose the 12, he spent all night in prayer. He prays all night long. And still got Judas. Whoa, 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 God. I thought if I prayed, the least you could do was keep Judas off my list. I thought that if I read my Bible and came to church on a Monday night, and was nice to folk I don't even like on general Christian principle. That I didn't cuss folk that know they deserve to get cussed out. That I was faithful in ministry and serving the least you could have done. I prayed and still got Judas. I prayed. And this is what I got? Now, now, now hear me. Why would Jesus pray all night long? It's real simple. He's got a decision to make. He's got to choose 12 out of all the other disciples, and he wants to pray because Jesus models to us that every decision you make ought to be bathed in prayer. Somebody, you can't shout because your neighbor thinks you're saved. So do me a favor. If you know you made some bad decisions because you didn't pray the way you should have, I just need you to wink your eye. Come, j j j I, I see, uh-huh, uh, if I had prayed a little, uh, you, you know what it's like not to pray the way you ought to before you make a decision? Jesus prays because he's got a decision to make. Now what is the purpose of praying over a decision to make certain that my choice is aligned with God's will. The reason I pray is so that God can open my eyes to see what I don't see. I pray so God can purge the impure desires of my heart and I make a decision that is not based on the flesh but in alignment with the will of God. Come here, Lily Grove. If Jesus prays all night so that his decision 
is aligned with the will of God. And in the morning, he still chose Judas. If he prayed all night so that his decision was in alignment with the will of God, and in the morning, he still chose Judas. Okay, y'all are slow. If his prayer was not my will, but thy will be done. And in the morning, he still got. What does that mean about Judas? That Judas is in God's will for your life. Somebody saying, I didn't come to church on a Monday night for this, but Judas is necessary. Judas sets the stage for resurrection. Judas pushes you to the cross. Judas makes you pray. Judas made you get your life together. Judas made you call on the name of the Lord. I'm looking for some grown folk at Lily Grove that can look back over your life and identify a Judas. And on tonight, you can lift up your hands and thank God for Judas. Thank God she lied on me. Thank God he broke my heart. Thank God they didn't value me. Thank God. God, I went through what I went through. Is there anybody here who knows God used Judas? Goodbye, Lily Grove. May the Lord bless you mighty good. I came by to help somebody. Judas is inevitable. Judas is necessary. But know this, God is so much God that God can use Judas. Here it is that even though you've got and Judas on your resume, there are two other words you ought to remember. The next time you get some and Judas, remember these two words, and Judas, but God. going home right now I need some but God testimony I need some but God revelation someone who knows it was Judas but God worked it together but God turned it around but God made a way is there anybody here that knows but God but God 